Italian land. A hundred to one shot, you call him a club. Can outrun the favorite, all he needs is a gut. Your final return will not diminish. And you can be the queen of the crop. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. And you're gonna finish on top. It's not where you start. such nice new warm clothes. <laughs> See mine? I told my social worker I have to stay living on this block because every time all you experimental theater people throw out your used experiments into the dumpsters every week, I get new clothes. And did you see the street fair up on St. Mark's Place? They got the big platforms and the little Polish girls up on them dancing in little red boots. I can't wait till they throw away them little red boots. <laughs> oh, see my little puppy? Someone threw him away. He was living in an alley and my boyfriend brought him to Lucille. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. But I don't like my boyfriend no more because he brought his friends to see me too and he got money from them for them seeing me. Yours ever do that to you? He will. Men are all alike. But not my little puppy whoopy. No, he loves his Lucille. Oh, look what I got in here for him. The Greek man over to the Greek place, he loves my little puppy, and he give me meat leftovers for it every day this week. I can eat it now, too. See my new teeth? <laughs> I don't have them big black gaps no more. <laughs> I smile now, and I don't scare people. The city give me them, but I ain't going back because their medication makes me dizzy. You can't dance on Stella's Eve. That's what I do, you know. I dance. Look, see, I can dance. I dance like a fairy. I'm going to wait till those little Polish girls throw away their boots, then I'm going to come dance for you. They got special stuff in the boots that makes you dance good. I'm going to get you to put me in some of them experiments you put on so I can dance. Oh, but you won't let me put my puppy in is why I've never done it. I can't leave puppy whoopy alone. I'm afraid if I do, my boyfriend will come by and take him away. He comes by every night and bangs on the door and makes the locks rattle and I can't sleep or practice my dancing. You gotta practice to be a dancer. Did I show you I dance? <coughs> I dance like a fairy. I danced like a fairy when I was a little girl in school. <laughs> oh. Hey, if you hold my puppy, I can really dance for you. No, he don't stink. That's the meat in there the Greek give me. <laughs> well, if you wait here, I'll go up and give him a bath, and then you can hold him and I can dance for you. No? Oh, okay. You go ahead with your friend then. Some other time, though. Where are you two going to? What's auditions? Oh, wait. 
I know where they come for you to see them so you can tell are they good enough to be in your experiments, right? Well, you got to audition your experiments for me. I'll find a puppy sitter, and I'll come see your experiments, and if they're good enough, I'll dance like a fairy for you in my little red boots. <laughs> Is your experiment going to be in there? Or there? There? <laughs> Where? On Broadway. Oh, I don't know if I want to be that far uptown. <laughs> hey, your boyfriend's waving at you. I think he wants you to come pay for all them records. <laughs> Oh, I see mine coming, too. I gotta go run hide. Uh, give Lucy a little kiss, huh? I won't go if you don't. Thanks. Oh, and Robert, do you have any change you can spare? No. Oh, well, then do you need some? <laughs> Implausible. Oh, impossible. Robert? Dear boy! At last! How did your Times interview go? Beautifully, I'm sure. Oh, and dear Mark, did you buy bales and bales of rare rock and roll records? Hmm? Break, break, break! And everybody! You too! Dear Mark, if you don't mind, let Papa talk to his playwright. Now, Robert, we have a problem to contend with before we begin reading that lobby full of girls. I'm not worried about them. We've been seeing splendid women. But, Robert, how are we ever to cast your blasted soldier? The boys you missed this morning, hopelessly endearing, incapable of expressing ugliness or aggression. This one boy, most promising juvenile in America, so we're told terminally amiable. He read your paranoid, megalomaniac, drug-addicted, kill-crazed, religious, fanatic foot soldier as if it were a particularly cloying commercial for pudding pops. Why let him beam his way through three lines, sounding like Mary Bleeding Poppins, before I blew up and said, no, 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 young man, you're not here hosting a game show. You're out of your mind on LSD in a screeching jungle, alive with enemy assassins. You're standing in the still steaming guts of a Viet Cong you've just killed, and you bellow anger and outrage and defiance at God. And our prize pop said, oh, and ruffled his bangs to indicate cosmic despair, <laughs> and recommenced reading as if he were reciting Winnie the Pooh. Aren't American men trained to do anything other than charm? It's no wonder you brought Jack and Todd over to act in London. You've cornered your culture's last two ball-bearing males. <laughs> Which brings us to business. Robert, I have been given the awesome duty of informing you that one of the boys we're seeing tomorrow morning is Todd. He's here. He phoned today, flew over from London, left the company at his own expense, and he's dying to read. Now, of course, I've no doubt he could do it. After six months over there playing the busboy, hearing Jack do the soldier eight times a week, of course, he's too young and too short. We'll have to reduce the furniture on his side of the stage to prevent him from hitting a child by the rest of the cast. Oh, but he is an absolutely marvelous actor. I must say you can pick him. And I simply see no better choice. Robert, the point is, Robert, that although if the personal situation between you and Todd and Jack, and, and for all I know, dear Mark, is going to make it psychologically untenable for you to concentrate during rehearsals with Todd, then of course we will veto him, but I must caution you, he may be all we've got. Of course, there is that film boy coming from California. But who knows if he can do stage? How can casting such a great role be such a conundrum? How could an avant-garde playwright saddle me with casting a type which is apparently extinct? Robert, tell me. Please do correct me if I'm wrong. Do I not hear that there is a William Inge revival currently afoot in this country? Well, will someone please tell me where did they get the studs?
right, now, sit you doing, Bubbo. Make yourself to home. You'll take your picture for the almighty times later. I want to catch up with you. Will you be after mutton tay? Oh, God, stop me when I fall into the Irish accent. It's symptomatic. Just sit there on the bed. Oh, don't worry, you didn't kick anything. I took some plywood and built a base around the bed. Why? Oh, God. Why did I build a solid base around me bed? Oh, Jesus and Mary. Okay. You remember the last time I asked you to read my tarot cards? Four and many a moon ago? Oh, you remember. I had two job offers, and mere broth of a girl that I was, I couldn't decide which one to take. So, as usual, I came to the resident sage of the Lower East Side to have my mind made up. God, you must remember. One job was assistant to a mighty fucking Vogue fashion photographer. Surefire career move, big bucks. And t'other one was this ditzy traveling assignment to do characteristic Irish landscapes for a New Jersey calendar company. And you grumbled, why can't you kids make up your own minds, and reluctantly threw your cards and said, okay, the one path offers security and wealth, and the other, wisdom and adventure. Which I didn't need a sage to tell me, but I was, as I said in those days, indecisive. So, true disciple to your bohemian example, I took the calendar gig. Travel, broadening, same reasons you went to England, right? And we both got caught. They brought you back for Broadway, and I, God help me, am photographing housewares for mail order catalogs. But, there I was. 16, passing for 20, in Ireland's very pleasant land, churning out cibachromes of peasant lasses in emerald hillsides and meadows just clotted with cows. And then she met, guess what? This lad from the IRA, or so he said. Curly hair, thick neck, you'd have loved him. And I start getting letters from a certain New Jersey calendar company inquiring when I'm sending another batch of Moo Cow masterpieces because I'm considerably preoccupied. And then he says he has to go away. He's on the lam. I never knew from just who. And who decides to go with him but little Wren, our girl photographer, all for love, la. I got some great pictures. I did that. One I took through a bullet hole in a window pane. You can see the British soldier down below with his rifle still aimed up at me. Great depth of field. And another I turned in the street and took. This whole mob of Protestant vigilantes is coming for us while this bomb we planted is just going off. Jeep wheels and human limbs careen and through the misty morning air. Great stuff, I tell ya. So we're smuggling guns from America is what we're doing and I'm being dragged from port to port to claim shipments of camera equipment, which is actually ammunition, and by the end, he and I are hiding out in a wee stone cottage somewhere well to the east of Helen gone with nothing on the horizon but bug, bug, bug. And one night, we're in bed in the dark, and someone busts the door down with rifle butts and binds and gags us in bed. English or Protestant or even some splinter group of his own organization, whatever it was, I never really knew, God knows, and there is no God. And someone grunts, Yankee whore, we got nothing against you, lie still. <coughs> and they shoot him through the head beside me, and no one finds us till noon, so from dawn until noon, I'm lying there while his blood soaks my gag, watching the flies picnic on the brains oozing out of his curly head. So... That's why she built the base around her bed. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll explain. I took this studio on 6th Avenue, right? Here in the heart of the bustling garment district. Every time one of those hundreds of trucks out there backfires, Joan of Arc here dives under her bed. <laughs> I built the boards around the bed to break the habit before I broke me head. I'm probably the only 30-year-old pot-and-pan photographer in New York with shell shock. Ah, come. We'll take your celebrity portrait for the times. <laughs> hurry up, hurry up. Mm. Uh, hello, uh, Mr.
Mr. Patrick, uh, this is Michael. I'm the guy that interviewed you for the New York Times. Uh, look, Mr. Patrick, no, I don't think I can call you Bob. You're not going to like me for what I called to tell you. Listen, this is very hard for me, and I could get into a lot of trouble if you tell anyone about it. If you tell anyone about it, I'll have to deny it. I can't go to the wall for you in this. I just can't. Well, but you seem like such a nice guy, and I didn't want you to think it was my idea. Oh, okay, just listen, okay? First, I'm sorry I couldn't let your boyfriend... I assume he's your boyfriend, the kid with the tape deck? Well, I'm sorry I couldn't let him record our interview. Well, I believe he did say he got the tape, the Post, and the News, and the Village Voice guy. God, he must have thought I was a creep. Oh, come on, sure he did. But listen, I just couldn't let him get us on tape because... <clears throat> and I just go ahead and say it. I had orders to make you look like a fool, sound like a fool. What are you laughing at? Oh, I must not have made myself clear. You see, I had orders. I mean, you're going to hate what I've written. I had to take everything out of context and the rewrite boys and made it sound even worse. You see... Word around the department is the London critics dish the times for not having discovered you first, so we're out to get ourselves off the hook by presenting you as an idiot. They are, I mean. This isn't funny. This is my first big job. I mean, I had no idea it would be this bad at the top. I'm sure I was ready for compromise, subterfuge, cynicism, hell, even unadulterated evil, but this, this petty, small-minded, self-serving vindictiveness... I wish you wouldn't laugh. Look, I read your play last night. I hoped it would be awful, but it's great. I mean, you're a great guy. I feel awful. I had to warn you, but I warn you, if you tell anyone about it, I'll have to deny it. I can't go to the wall for you. I wish I understood what was so amusing. This is really bad. Oh, and the picture. The woman who took your picture, she sent them a whole stack to choose from, and they pick one that makes you look like a madman. Your hair every which way, and in a leopard-spotted T-shirt. I tell you, it's a kill job! Please don't laugh at me! I'm telling you is all I can do. Except, maybe. Look, I deliberately turned in my material a few lines short on purpose. I wanted to save you a space to say something you might especially want to say at the end of the interview. Well, I owe you that. I don't know how many people will see it, because who reads a whole theater interview, but it's all I can do. I mean, I can't go... I can't go public with this. I'll lose my job. But if it's not too provocative, I, I might can slip in some sort of statement for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, hold on a minute. Okay, what? Say that again, I can't make it out for your goddamn laughing. You what? <laughs> you want to tell the world? <clears throat> you want to tell the world you just adore America? <laughs> Oh, hello, Bob. Oh, it has been so long now, so very, very long. No, I am not answering them. They're on the machine. Here. Sit here. Try these canapes. They're Nigerian. Ali adores them. <laughs> Which is interesting because in convent school in Africa, I studied Aboriginal anatomy. And from cranial proportions, it's likely Ali's ancestors were Nigerian. Oh, I wish you two could meet. He's shy about my friends. It's residual tribalism. The ethnoanalytical literature mentions it. And of course, he's away right now. Oh, I am so glad you came by. No, 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 let them ring. I have to rest sometimes. It was sweet of you to ask me to audition for your play. Wouldn't acting on Broadway be an adventure? But we've started this business, and I'm left here to manage. <laughs> of all things, the one I never studied. But Ali has. He's made me feel foolish not to have examined capitalism from within. He's shown me we can use its own weight against it. Oh, I can read your mind. 
just another of Simone's black boyfriends. But he's more, Bob. I've evolved in that respect. Of course I have a tropism for black men. They like me too. I'd argue that it's an effective evolutionary instinct. It's certainly as efficacious as daddy's UN teams teaching the Ghanaians to grow soybeans. You should be grateful for it. If I hadn't eloped from my convent with that black camel driver, Daddy never would have exiled me to that maximum security play school in Texas, and I couldn't have run away to New York and been in your plays. Or met American black men. Oh, you. You only remember the crazy ones that used to come by and try to chop our door down. You never stepped into those cubicles and saw those frightened boys out of their flashy clothes. I learn more in that massage parlor than in all my colleges. <laughs> more than working in your plays, even. Those black boys and I, we were mythological. Like something out of the Eleusinian mysteries. True, maybe at first I was just like Mama, playing with her beach boys in Mallorca. But then I became aware of where I was and what I was doing to them. What had been done to them that made them willing to eat out of my shoes and all that white goddess stuff. We've destroyed them, Bob. Beyond the physical exploitation of their labor, we have used them for our self-realization and denied them theirs. We've deprived them of the most elementary basis for self-respect, and we wonder why they sublimate in crime. I tell you, I have virtually abandoned psychologies premised on the unconscious and subconscious, even behavioral and archetypal models. I've become convinced that the urge to be moral, to think well of oneself, is the strongest of all psychic drives. I must help these people attain that. I must. Look, look what Ali is capable of. No, he's American. He was born Stanford something, some white slave owner's name. Look, we've written emerging nations offering to help them acquire farm machinery and textbooks and medicine. Uh, well, that's them that keep phoning. You have no idea. I speak some of the languages. I'm able to be helpful to him. Well, look, look, it's very real. See, here are some of the letters. See, I sign them. I'm titular head, but Ali is the brains. All he needed was someone to reinforce his concept of his own credibility, to make him see that someone could unconditionally, unsuspiciously believe him. And I do, Bob. And it's paying off. Well, already we've received seed money from my UN connections. Well, that's why Ali can't be here. He's taken all our money down to Mexico to invest in more promising currencies. <laughs> I never would have thought of that. He's way ahead of me. It had to be him that went. Well, there are so many people phoning and writing about their orders. Not that I know what exactly to tell them, but I do speak the languages. Ali was right. It had to be me that stayed. I, I am so glad you came by. It's so lonely here with Ali gone and... The phone's ringing and him gone. So long a time now. So very, very long. Waiter. Hey, waiter! Okay. <clears throat> How about, hey, good looking? Right. Tequila sunrise, please. <coughs> hey, Bob! Over here! Don't have a heart attack. Look, it's Todd. <laughs> Come on. Don't look funny. I'm not mad. Are you mad? Waiter, that's a tequila sunrise! Do you want one? No, you're in rehearsals. Sit down. It's okay. I know you cast that movie star instead of me. I would have done the same thing. Don't be shy with me. Waiter, I'm 21. Here's my passport, see? Oh, God. Look at us, back at Phoebe's. Did you see they put up a London poster? Oh, God, Jack looks good. <coughs> the frame cuts off my name. Just. Did you arrange that? I'm just kidding. I know you wouldn't. God, 
Bob, I hate to see you looking so dazed. You should be feeling good. International production? Hmm? Phoebe's hanging our poster? <laughs> Come on, mellow out. Look, I promise you, I know you had nothing to do with my not getting the role. I'm too young. Movie stars real good. I know you wouldn't let anything personal interfere with the production. Hell, you took me over to England after the hell I put you through here. I believe in you. I know you wouldn't let what happened between Jack and me influence you. Look, <laughs> listen to me like you used to. Please, if I haven't made that impossible. The part doesn't matter. I didn't come back to the States for the part. I was going, uh, um, I got it on my big drink. Hey, beautiful, you remember me on the tequila sunrise? Bob, I was run out of England. I was peddling hash and I fucked that up. With the Turkish cops, I would have been raw meat in the rape room. The British gave me a choice, skip the country, stand trial. I picked leaving or I might have gotten Jack into trouble living with him. You did know I was living with him, didn't you? Oh, God. I love him, Bob. You should understand that. You loved him before you met me. You should understand. I left to save him. I don't want anything from you. Just relax, please. Just not to the point of breaking down and crying, okay? And the help here already knows far too well what the two of us look like in tears. And still, you took me over to England for my break. And Jack. You gave me everything, and I fucked everything up. Jack would have been better off with you. I would have been better off with you. You're better off without either of us. I'd be a whole hell of a lot better off if that faggot would bring a tired tot his D-R-I-N-K! Rehearsal's going okay? <laughs> Film guy good? He better be. Oh, Jack is... He's so great to watch in that part. I bet he thinks I came back here to steal it, too. I hope I didn't wreck his life by leaving. Hell, let's face it. I hope he notices I'm gone. I hope he just doesn't start fucking my understudy. I hope I just don't start fucking the waiter. God, we are such trash. Me, Jack, I don't know what you ever saw in us. I love him. I do. I know now how you could get so crazy over me. I'm getting paid back. I hope that makes you happy. We've made you so unhappy. We're perfect for each other. Jack and me. You feel too much. I gotta go. I gotta meet somebody. Anybody. Hey, gorgeous! Cancel the sunrise. trying to avoid you. I can't go back in there for your second act. I brought you these flowers, but now I just don't know. I don't know if I'm at a preview or a flashback. God, I wanted to yell, no, don't go to the march on Washington. Cops beat your husband and he gets hooked on morphine. Or no, don't take your big scrapbook with you to Woodstock. Norwegian journalists steal all your letters from Dylan. God. She is me, isn't she? That incredibly young woman playing the hippie? God! Did you hear your audience talking at intermission? Those are the people that set police dogs on me, and now they're praising you for capturing my essence. Did you see the go-go fashions they're wearing? Designers leaned out of windows on 7th Avenue and copied what we wore on our peace marches, so those matinee fascists in their tie-dye denim could cheer me on stage, then laugh at my clothes in the lobby. God! But I'm 
I'm not sure you're not the worst of all. Those are the minute particulars of my real life that you've turned into some universal symbol. I'm completely forgotten, but I'm on the West End and Broadway. She's paid to play me, and I'm taking in piecework sewing jobs, Robert! If I write my own life now, someone will call me a plagiarist. God! I know in my heart that you love me and revere me, but you know in yours, you're standing there listening to me, and all you're hearing is one more dynamite monologue. God! Right, I see you. I see you, mister. You're hailing the cab or drying your nail polish. Okay, I'm stuck. Get in. Oh, that's right. Don't step over anything. Just step right in and climb in. The cab was smelling too good anyway. Hop in! I don't think you quite got the door. I think your scarf's caught in it. You got it now? Good. Where to? Mark Hellinger Theater. All of five blocks, right? <laughs> what the hell's going on there this time of night? Hey, wait. I heard a uh, big, big dance concert, celebrities only, right? Hey, you mind if I turn on the ceiling light, get a good look at you? You, 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 you're the guy, the guy in the Times. The guy wrote the play I picked you up in front of. Opens tomorrow, right? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Must be great seeing your name in light. <laughs> so how come you're all alone, big celebrity? <laughs> well, hell, get another friend likes parties then. <laughs> he act? Well, that's your trouble. He should be an actor. <laughs> I was going to act. <laughs> Missed a lot of chances. Wasn't nice to the right people. <laughs> Had a friend bartending for celebrities. Caught on with them. <laughs> Has a series now. <laughs> oh, I was dumb. Had pretty good looks. Missed a lot of chances. Well, I'm sorry, but these damn lights. <laughs> Could have walked it quicker. <laughs> so, uh, got any other plays coming up on Broadway? Off Broadway? You're going to tour this one? Hey, any of your cast don't want to go? I got no responsibilities. I'll go. <laughs> Sure as hell don't mean to drive a cab all my life. Oh, fuck. God damn it, buddy, move it! Move it! Fuck, instruction. Shit. Hey, uh, look where we are. You see that parking lot? I know the guy runs it. Look, Sia, what do you think? What if I was to just pull in there for a little while and you give the guy 50 bucks? They don't care what. You ain't that bad looking, you know. Help a lot better than your picture. What if I was to uh, just pull in there and climb back in the back with you a little while? You got time. Hey, hey, look, don't get me wrong. I don't do this. I'm straight if you don't mind. It's even good, ain't it? You guys like that. Not that I'd expect anything, don't get me wrong, it's, it's just because I like you. It wouldn't take long. Hey, I'm a pretty hot guy. I used to be dumb, but I'm okay now. <laughs> I know what you guys like. No! Hey, 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 no kid, man. I wouldn't expect anything. I, hey, I know I'm not that young anymore. Hey! Hey, come back here. I, hey, look, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'll drive you to the Hellinger free. I don't want your money. Would you shut the fuck up, buddy? Look, if you change your mind, I'll wait for you outside. Hey, no strings, man. I just would like you should remember me. These seats do. I always sit here. You can put your feet up and 
watch the river and trees go by. Oh, this is so nice. Do you love trains? I do. You asked me why I live so far upstate. This is why. So every night before the show, I can have this trip in to prepare. Oh, don't be silly. I don't have to be alone. That isn't how I prepare. I'll be fine in your beautiful play tonight. Don't worry. You've been happy with previews, haven't you? So don't worry. We'll have a memorable opening night. <sighs> I'm glad to have you alone. I've been wanting to know more about you. You're from a tiny town, aren't you? So am I. Let me ask you, did you always know you'd get out? I did too. Did you know how you'd get out? I didn't either. I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone. I didn't want to act, ever. It was assumed I'd grow up to be an athlete. I like athletics. You know exactly what it takes to be the best and you can set right out and achieve it. I swam, played basketball, but neither one of those seemed like a very secure way out. I mean, I could have gone places for a while, the Olympics or whatever, but that's over young. And then what? You marry. And I didn't want to get out by marrying. I could have done that right there in Kansas. Believe me, I was pretty enough. <laughs> well, thank you, Robert, but I was really pretty then. If I'd stayed home, I probably would have been a governor's wife. But I met some governors and some probable future governors, and marriage to one of them didn't look like out to me. So, like you, I had to find another way. And then I found out that Daddy considered acting to be dignified. So that's how I got out, to go to acting school in California. And of course, being me, I became the best. First show they cast me in school was The Three Sisters. Masha, 18, fresh from Kansas, Masha. So I went directly to the library and studied. Hmm? Oh, no, not Stanislavski. That came much later. No, I studied the acting styles of the last part of the last century. Because I figured that's what Marsha would have seen in her formative years, that that would be the particular way she dramatized herself as the romantic heroine she'd seen in her childhood. Just as I judged myself against the noble heroines I'd grown up watching Deborah Carr and Greer Garson play. It just seemed obvious. So then, when rehearsals started, I played that into her gestures and postures and expressions, all that posing and striking of attitude. And the teacher said, well, that's wonderful, Shirley, but what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm playing Masha in the Del Sartre technique. And he said, good Lord, where did you learn about that? And I said, why, I studied at nights in the library on my own. And all the other students looked at me like I was a complete fool and said, why? And I knew then I would be the one to go to the top. If I'd been an athlete, I would have gone to the Olympics. If I'd been a governor's wife, he would have become president. Let me tell you, Bob, if I'd been a playwright, I would have been a success much younger than you. Oh, now that's no comment on you. I just wouldn't have settled for less. I would have been the best whatever I did. Oh, I didn't want to be anything in particular. I didn't want to get to any particular place. I just wanted to get out and be the best. And I did. And I am. Oh, it is so good now to have this little time on the train every night. Just a little time to unwind and be alone. Except, of course, for you, Bob. Hello, Robert. It's Tennessee. 
Say, whoever is that baritone who answers your very own phone? I don't recall anyone so reverberatory at your opening night party at Sardis. <laughs> well, what's he doing with a playwright if he doesn't like parties? <laughs> Never mind. I am spectacularly unqualified to offer personal advice. But speaking professionally, child, what have you done to the media? I have attempted to extol your delectable play to every reporter that has materialized before me, and I have been universally squelched. Well, think, you must have done something, because you are, to put it poetically, anathema to the jackals. Hmm. Well, as you know, I am in this depressing burg to peddle my past, that is, to publicize my memoirs. So I have been much among the jackals, and to a man they have informed me that they are under no circumstances permitted to, as they so pungently put it, plug you. <laughs> well, never mind. It will pass. Oh, it will pass. Now I, for convenient example, after a decade of their disdain, am currently so sought after for interviews that I am hard put to avoid oversubscribing my dance card. <laughs> Which brings me to my immediate point. Did you and your baritone happen to get up or stay up this morning in time to catch USAM or whatever it is, that dreadful morning show? That's morning with an R, as in early in the day, not morning with a U-R, as in lamentation. <laughs> I had a premonition you had not. Well, I'm sorry, because I employed a quaint device on your behalf. Well, uh, as you recall, I have with me here in New York my famously unbalanced sister, Rose, whom they all want with me in hopes that she will perform one of her legendary indecencies. So all coincidences coincided this sunrise on the aforementioned talk show, which happened, blessing of blessings, to be live. Well, the innocently lascivious announcer his eyes moist with anticipation of some scandal-worthy mishap, asked me if my sister Rose had been enjoying her stay in the Big Apple. In response to which I treacherously replied, Why, yes, my sister Rose has had a delightful time, especially at the greatest play of the decade, at which point I drop your name and that of your enviable achievement. <laughs> the announcer looked like a fresh-faced young sailor that just spent his first night in a whorehouse and found out they charge. <laughs> oh, but they can't do anything to you as long as you're alive. <laughs> oh, now don't thank me, darling. No, it was the least and the last the most that I could do. Now, all anecdotes to one side, how are you and I ever going to get together? That energetic lady at Sardis who insisted on detailing the resemblances between her great aunts and my great characters did somewhat interfere with our proliferating rapport. Hmm. You are? To California? Wouldn't you sooner be boiled in oil? Now, I hope you're not going out there to write the film of your own play. As Mr. Arthur Miller would say, they have boys to do that. Yeah, you should just lay on the sand and soak up surfers. That is, unless your baritone objects not only to parties, but to third parties. Well, say hello out there to anybody who remembers me. And let's plan on getting together in some more civilized ambience. Wherever on this tired, twisted globe a sight deserving of the appellation might survive. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. Now, I suspect I can intuit from your tremulous tone something of what you're going through. I can only offer the sage old southern advice. Follow your muse, whatever form he may take, and never let the bastards pull your teeth. <laughs> Yeah.
No, that's all. Just Zena. Why, yes, I've known Bob. I mean, Mr. Patrick. For years and years, before he became famous. Why, thank you. You're very kind. Bye now. as I could manage under the circumstances. Oh, Jesus, you don't get it, do you? Would that you did. Go back to your party, Bob. I'm sorry I couldn't come with you. You know what it's like for me at these things. Everyone always asking me, and what exactly do you do, Mark? Is it possible that there is a God and you get the rest without my having to say it? Okay, the kid will give you some clues. This light bag is my collection of t-shirts from everywhere we've been on the eastern seaboard. And this heavier one is all the rare records and tapes that you've been buying me. Bob, I'm leaving you. I don't want to go on tour. I'm tired of waking up not knowing where the John is. I want my own place. 
where I can unpack my stereo, alphabetize my LPs, just be a run-of-the-mill vinyl addict. Don't look like that. Now go back to your party. Gotta get about ten planes tomorrow. Now come on, Bob. This has been a wonderful experience. I'll always thank you. I'll always be grateful that I met you while you were still poor so that you know I love you for yourself. And I'll always thank you for the chance to share in your sudden celebrity so that you know... Well, I know I never want to be one. Bob, I want a home. I want a human life. I want my own nutcrackers and bath mats. Cashed in my ticket for California. I bought one in Chicago. I'll get some kind of job and I'll send you the money. All right, I'll send your producer the money. Thank him for me. It's been swell of him to pay my way the whole way, but Bob, I want to go home. Now, I've already called Veronica. She says she'll pick me up at the airport. She says she forgives me. Bob, I hope that someday you can come to, too. What do you mean, for what? <laughs> Bob, don't do this to me. Now I'm going to live with Veronica. What did you think, Bob? It was always me and Veronica. Christ. I thought you were just being tactful all this time. I should have known that you don't do tact. I convinced myself that this was a, the once in a lifetime. Bob, go back to your party. You deserve it. You deserve everything. You deserve something. You want to make love one last time before I go? I do. I, I want to. I love you. <laughs> Veronica has nothing to do with you. She doesn't resent you. She likes you. She loves you. I love you. Oh, God, in my next lifetime, please make me a heartless hustler. I'm going to climb onto the plane crying. Maybe that's why they call it the red eye. Ah, <laughs> come on, laugh. What's going to take? My impersonation of the disposal swallowing the pussycat? Oh, God, I'm going to miss you. I'll always miss you. Especially at night. You're a wonderful lover. Oh, that's just the sort of thing some cheap tramp would say in this situation. Is there anything else I can say to get out of this gracefully? Disgracefully. Catastrophically. Thank you for everything. You did give me everything, didn't you? I couldn't carry any more. <laughs> Are you absolutely thoroughly super lootly sure that you don't want to make grotesque love one more time before the kid takes away the playing equipment? I am sorry. I should have told you the truth. I thought you knew it. I wanted to think you knew it. I would have told you, but oh, Jesus, God, face it. What was there in the truth for me? I have to leave. Don't cry, Bob. And you don't need me. Look at where you're at. Look at what's ahead of you. Forging a whole new wonderful life for yourself. anybody from then. He doesn't know I ever knew those people. I mean, you're all right. Frank is knocked cold by the fact I know the actual author of a play booked into the Huntington Hartford, no less. That crap impresses him, so you're okay. But the others, God. There was a bunch of them on a talk show the other night, Avant-Garde New York. 
Jesus, are they still passing themselves off as avant-garde? And Frank said, do they have to encourage those pathetic misfits? I don't like freak shows. Just when they were showing a clip from one of my movies. <gasps> Thank God I never got photographed without that stupid glitter makeup, hey? Frank didn't know it was me. Can you believe it? Nobody out here knows that I was once the Manhattan underground superstar, Gentian Violet, okay? Okay. <laughs> Whew. I mean, shit. I understood where he was coming from. <laughs> I can hardly believe I ever ran with that bunch of outpatients. <laughs> and then they brought out Andy and a whole slew of them. <laughs> And I turned away so Frank wouldn't see my face. And our television was reflected in our sliding glass patio doors. So this whole couch, full of my old gang, looked just like they were sitting right out there in the middle of our croquet court. For we have, you may be sure, a croquet court. Jesus! <laughs> Can you believe that ten years ago, I was locked up in this mid-Manhattan hotel with a litter of those sleazoid werewolves. <laughs> We'd been shooting amphetamines for weeks. And all of a sudden, Crazy Jackie, you remember Crazy Jackie, went cold, turned blue, and we were sure that he was dead. And all we could think was how to dispose of the body. I mean it. That's all that was on our minds. We were beyond necrophilia. So, we slipped off his dress and corset, dragged him out into the corridor, and started trying to stuff him down a mail chute. Honest to God, don't ask me. It seemed perfectly logical at the time. Maybe because he was male? Well, a human body won't go down a mail chute, children. So, we decided if we slipped off his spike heel shoes, we might gently grind him in. And letters are plummeting past and all we can think is, oh Christ, it'll fill up with letters and there won't be room for him. And his toes are starting to bleed and we're shrieking like carnival time in Rio, banging and banging Jackie against the glass, trying, I swear to God in hell, to stuff a stiff down a mail chute. And all of a sudden, the son of a bitch comes to, looks around, and you won't believe this, after gaping at his bleeding feet, messing up this letterbox, all that queen can think of to say is, oh, hi, Frank, honey, uh, here, Bob, have a daiquiri. Frank has a wicked way with a daiquiri. Um, honey, could you hear us over the blender? Bob here was just telling me about his new play, weren't you, Bob? about those pitiful drug people in New York. Come on, let's take our drinks out onto the patio. And Bob, tell Frank, what did that disgusting junkie say? Sir, aren't you Mr. Robert Patrick? Well, this is real nice running into you outdoors like this. I was just on my way to that stuffy auditorium to introduce you to my company. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I run this theater program. I'm Devin Cudahy. My, no one's called me Cud since my college days. Do I know you, sir? Yeah. Maybe if we both removed our sunshades. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit I still don't know who you are. Pat O'Connor? Well, my word, what are two New Mexico clodhoppers doing in a college arts complex in the middle of Idaho? No, the actors can wait a little. They're on salary, I am proud to say. I want to absorb this. My company's going to have a good laugh soon enough over the fact that the old man didn't realize our visiting celebrity playwright was his old college buddy, Pat O'Connor. I hope I don't have to tell you how much I admire your beautiful play. We made buses available for the entire company to ride over to Minneapolis to see it. 
you know, I dream of producing it here, but uh, uh, tell me, do you prefer Pat or Robert now? <coughs> all right then, Bob, tell me, uh, did you really live through all of that revolutionary 60s horror that you wrote about in New York? I'm sorry, it seemed to me it would have been a horror. I spent exactly one week of my life in New York on a furlough in the 50s, and I'm here to tell you I gave up the very idea of professional theater because I thought I'd have to do it in that filthy city. And I probably don't have to remind you I was always fairly conservative, even before that word became a battle cry. More than insult. I would have said you were crazy if I'd known you went to New York. Now, I personally looked around for a clean, quiet town that needed a speech teacher and had snow. One thing the desert lacked for me, snow. And this little Hick Junior College gave me a beat-up old Quonset hut and an annual budget of $700. Well, they didn't expect me to do any theater, but you remember me, I snuck it in as speech exercises. Nobody was much paying attention to me, so I did what I wanted to. Aeschylus, Shakespeare, Moliere, Miller, Shaw, all the things they wouldn't let us do in New Mexico because they said the public wouldn't go for them, remember? And then just as we always tried to tell our teachers would happen, these townspeople who've never seen any theater, came to see the best that Western dramatic literature had to offer and didn't know any better than to love it. So, I got to keep me the unexpected ticket receipts and eventually I built myself a real little theater and then a bigger one and then we started attracting state and federal money. And now, 20 years along, I have me a thousand seat theater and an equity company, augmented by 75 <coughs> hand-picked students, and a core audience from 25 surrounding cow towns who have come to accept serious theater. And I never had to do one script that I was ashamed of. And now here I am, bringing in an old friend who's come to his own success by quite another road, and a damn fine, sunshiny Idaho day for it, too. Whew. Pardon me. I'm getting a little bit teary there. I will do that. You see, I so hope to ask you today to let us try doing your fine play here as a start to my maybe bringing in other new plays to help us isolate it out here to connect with all the changes going on out there in the great new world. But uh, where I'm coming from right now is our controller's office. It seems there was this Board of Education election I didn't pay sufficient attention to, and we we're about to lose much of our funding. So I have to guarantee a lot of fiduciary busybodies that the company can pay its own freight on box office alone, and the plant's so big now. So many people's livelihoods depending on it. I may not be able to do just what I want to anymore. Like break a new ground with a new kind of play. We plowed that old Quonset hut under many moon ago. And I probably won't be able to draw him in in big enough numbers except by doing plays they've seen the movie musical of on television. I just didn't believe that this could happen. I thought I was building something whose value was self-evident. I maybe should have paid more attention to what I guess people like you were saying way off there. Of course, you were way off there. Well, never mind. Come on, meet my company. You may be our only ever visiting original playwright. You're right, I shouldn't be so pessimistic. I'm sure we'll be doing your plays eventually. We'll just have to wait for them to become classics. <laughs> Bob? Sugar? Welcome to the Southland. Now you hop right in this toy. Oh, you sweet thing. 
and make double sure your seatbelt is secure. We are running late. <sighs> Don't you look too handsome? Is that from the Oregon Dramathon? My, don't those rich schools do such eye-catching t-shirts. Did you get fed in flight? Isn't that airline food too good? Then, we can either take you right onto your motel, or there are three of the cutest speech classes you ever did see just itching to hear you talk about Shakespeare in the library. But, if you're too tired, I can put them to making paper mache elephant heads for the halftime ceremonies. I'm doing the halftime ceremonies at a drama club now, so we can get us a bit of that enormous <laughs> sports budget and maybe make the use of a bus. You'll talk to them? Oh, that is so gracious of you. Then, all we have you scheduled for is to talk on playwriting to the assembled English students. And maybe critique some two character sophomore scenes in the lunchroom while we feed you the best little old southern cooking you ever set tooth into. Isn't that too good? <laughs> then, you and I will take a relaxing drive through Civil War sites. While I return the hoop dresses, I wangled out a little theater league for a plantation ball we do to raise money for our spring musical. No, bless you, school doesn't give us any money. Drama's extracurricular. I have thought you might leave the little theater ladies in some improvisations while I grade some algebra tests. <laughs> if you do, they'll let us rehearse their Tuesdays and Thursdays when the cheerleaders take our space. Oh, you sweet thing, you are too good. And right after, the Dixie drama mamas would adore to hear you talk on acting opportunities for their children. And some of the children, too, if you don't mind them running in and out to rehearse skits for our Kiwanis Club fathers, Because Kiwanis gives us some of their gumball machine money for providing entertainment for their meetings. Would that be an imposition? <laughs> you are a saint. And then... The kids have made box dinners so you can dine like a gentleman of leisure and watch our run through of arsenic and old lace while freshmen and I build scenery. And then, if you have any energy left at all, the cast would just forever remember it if you could give them even just a few little notes and it would let me free to paint the stage if you do. Oh, you angel! We have to paint this evening because we can't get the floor sanded from the custodian until after 10. Then... The Thespian Club are coming by my house for milk and cookies, if you care to tell them about the hard grind in professional theater. But only the ones with straight A's, because I won't let any student participate with less. So two of them can't come. But I've arranged those two would drive you to the airport tomorrow morning so they get that crack at you too. But I will drive if you prefer and break in top bake sale funds and hire a substitute teacher for me and just not get my kids t-shirts at all this year if you say so. Oh, Bob, you'll talk to them. Oh, that is so democratic of you. Mwah. And just before that, you debate with the president of the school board on the value of the arts, which he's dead set against. But then the papers come and he'll present you with a plaque, which my husband's shop class donated did cost drama cent. I'll leave my budget meeting to make sure there's no violence in case those fundamentalists show up again. But they probably won't get physical with a celebrity like you if the papers are there. You think? Oh, and look, here we are. Oh, and they brought out the brass band. Oh, isn't that wonderful, Bob? Isn't that too good? Here, here, everybody. Here he is. Come and get him. <laughs> In here, bozo, and no back talk. You gotta scrub up before you operate on my students' minds. Go take a look in that mirror. Warning, you look like something just scraped off a shoe. Now this is the so-called teacher's so-called called lounge. In here is so-called coffee. Go and pour yourself a cup. Now look, I am placing an entire dollar bill in the coffee kitty so you can completely replace your so-called blood. You got a cup? Good. And now take a sip. A good one. Okay, Bob. I have now been a father for three years, and I am going to talk to you like one. How many days were you on that bus? From how far away? How many schools did you talk to in Alaska? 
How many classes? Did they pay you? Did they pay your way? And how many of them can ever even do your plays? Jesus Christ. Lord, don't tell Jane I blaspheme. She won't let me watch Night Court. <laughs> oh, she's fine. The boys are fine. You'll see them after school. Don't divert me. Bob, what are you doing with your life? I have postcards from every Greyhound terminal in the continent of the United States with the Alaska one en route. Bob, you're burning yourself out, spreading the gospel of free theater to places that can only do Hello, Dolly and Charlie Brown, right? I swear you're more Christian than we are. You should be arrested. No, you are arrested. You should be stopped. Bob, do you realize the last new play you sent me was before Alex was even born and he's three now? I said he's fine. He's dying to see his uncle, Bob. He claims to remember you, so here, you better shave and give him a fighting chance. Or is that just mildew on your face? Hot water's on the left. No, Bob, your left. <laughs> you won't recognize Alex. Last time you saw him, he wanted to be what? Tinkerbell? <laughs> Now he won't respond unless he's properly addressed as R2-D2. <laughs> oh, and Polly, you're going to love Polly. He has all the motor skills of a tuna casserole. <laughs> oh, God, which is better than you're doing. Bob, did you cut yourself? Bob, are you drinking? I don't see how the way you're spilling that coffee. You shouldn't drink coffee when you shave. <sighs> Never mind. Fortunately, I brought you a clean T-shirt. <laughs> It says, Robert Patrick Week at Hayesville High. I named a week after you to atone for not naming a baby after you, but Jane is adamant you can't be a godfather until you believe in God. Only way you'll ever get when a Lady Jane's name for you is for you to change your name to it. And since the sonogram says the new one is a female, means you'll have to sign all your future works, Rose Patrick. Well, you can't. You'll invalidate 200 hand stencil $10 t-shirts. <laughs> oh, God, don't laugh, Bob. You'll lose a lift. Concentrate on your shaving, and I will tell you an instructive anecdote. The principal called me into his office to say we couldn't do the plays I scheduled this year because A, Godspell is sacrilegious, B, Harvey has a drunk for a hero, C, Inherit the Wind teaches evolution, and D, Womb Room, the one I wrote about Jane expecting Alex, is obscene. Well, D did it. I jumped on his desk like a Raquel Welch in Myra Breckenridge and said, my wife's womb is not obscene. Then I mailed the schedule to every newspaper for five counties, signed with his name. <laughs> he didn't dare fire me. Hmm. So out of pity... I yielded on Inherit the Wind. Three out of four ain't bad, huh? Bob, the moral is, I never would have had the courage to stand up to him like that if I hadn't had your example ever since you came here and fought for our right to do Rocky Horror Show when we were sophomores. So come on. There must be hundreds like us carrying on your good work. Can't you rest now, Johnny Theater Seed? There aren't. Oh, well, you failed utterly. Why try? I mean, look which would work. To say you lit the torch of higher drama nationwide and can now retire, or to swear it's useless and you might as well cave in. Things aren't so bad, you have to sacrifice your health, or they're never going to get better, so why try? I'll go either way to save you from killing yourself with overwork for a bunch of ungrateful deadhead drama teachers. Incidentally, you're talking to five classes today. I'm worse than Alaska. No, you don't, Bob. Don't you, don't you hug me. You, you smell like a beach. Just put on your Robert Patrick t-shirt. I left my so-called class reading your so-called plays, and you have to make an appropriately together entrance.
We all set? Now we Let me have a look at you. You have some foam behind your right ear. No, you're right. <laughs> Pull down your nice clean t-shirt. Stand up straight. There. You look very nice. Rose. Oh, come on, smile. I bet you do. I bet I can. Okay, how's this? In your honor, today only, I am wearing beneath my good guy jogging togs a garter belt and that opera hose. <laughs> Made you laugh. You know what you need, Bob? Jane said, and Jane is never wrong. You need to marry some nice boy and settle down. Oh, come on, Bob. Let's go do the time warp again, huh? Come on. Long day. Long one. Mm. Hear the crickets? John says they remind him of our Puerto Rican neighbors in New York. Oh. He'd love to sit up with us. He apologizes. But he has to be up at five to get everybody's breakfast, and I gotta truck the produce into market by six. Hell. We can chat now for a while. If we keep it low. <sighs> Wish we could lure you into staying longer. Kids drive you off. They behave today. We're getting another one in May. John, <coughs> white kid for a change. Eight years old. Our sixth. <clears throat> I don't know how John does it. I feel like a pig going off leaving him here. You watch him with the kids today. Six hours a day, by law, he spends teaching them. Besides handling the goats and chickens and doing what he can on the new house, <laughs> this rate we expect it up about 2001. Oh. But with six kids soon and the oldest one nearly in puberty, we need more room. Hell, this weekend we're digging a new pit for the privy. Wish you could stay the weekend. Not just to help with the privy. Spring equinox. There's a fairy ring on Liberty Mountain. You'd love that. Theatrical. This sort of convent of boys up there raise goats, sell cheese. And four times a year, leftover hippies from five states dance naked around bonfires. <laughs> just like our old East Village parties, but 150 miles from the fuzz. <laughs> Only time now we smoke weed, drink booze, or do magic mushrooms. Because of the kids, and two, it keeps it special. And there's lots of boyfriends for John to fool around with in the woods, and loads of beautiful witch women for me. Oh, I made you up a bundle of our newsletters, RFD. Stands for Rural Fairies and Dykes. And my Mother Merrill's Magic Mushroom Recipe Book, and John's articles on our fight to teach the kids at home. Oh, I wish you could have been here for that. Oh, we could have used a playwright for skits and speeches. <clears throat> we won, though, anyway, and it was worth it. What's the sense taking them out of the ghettos if you're just going to put them in Tennessee schools? Ooh. Much worse than you've heard. <laughs> John says the reason they don't believe in evolution in Tennessee is because it hasn't happened to them yet. <laughs> I wish we could talk you into settling here. The cities are bad for you. I know your traveling to schools helps some, but that's mostly cities too, isn't it? God, I can hardly bear to truck into Nashville anymore. I know we all agreed a long time ago that the culture's collapsing, but who knew it would take this long? I know when the kids reach their teens, there's going to be a natural urge for them to hit the cities, find work, screw around. I know it's what we did, but the cities were too rotten to save then, and look how they've deteriorated. Sure, it's rough here. I notice you only nibbled at John's squirrel and rabbit stew. Vegetarian? 
just couldn't handle it, huh? Well, you would if it was all the meat you got. I wish you could have watched the kids as we got them one by one. <laughs> First time John milked a goat and handed a dipper full to Alana, she almost swallowed her tongue. <laughs> she saw where it came from and thought we were trying to make her drink goat piss. <laughs> well, she'd lived her life locked in a closet until her mother died and some neighbors found her. What could you expect? She's better now. They all are. And this new little one coming. White boy. See how the others take to him. You really ought to get some kids, Bob. You'd learn everything. <clears throat> Listen. <coughs> Bob. This is Mama Merrill talking. I know you. All this running yourself ragged, visiting every school in the world. I watched you with Todd. I know how shocked you were to see that a kid as bright as Todd could get so fucked up so young. You're running through all these schools trying to save a hundred thousand Todds. But Bob, it's too big. And it may be way too late. You might be better off settling somewhere and trying to save just one. Listen, I'm closer. I'll tell you a secret. John and I are considering, biologically, having one <laughs> before I get too old. Several of my girlfriends have. They say there's nothing like it. We could. John and I have made it together several times lately. You get close to nature up here. <laughs> when I hinted about us having our own, John just fluffed that big white beard at me and said, Fine, do what you want, just don't expect me to carry it. <laughs> he is the greatest. Do people still say the greatest? I couldn't have found anybody better to spend my life with. Boy, when I think what worn out revolution refugees we were, well, you wrote our wedding ceremony. You know we only got married to make it easier to keep our city jobs. But then, we found out how alike we were and how alike we thought. And now, we got the farm and our kids of all colors and my witches and his warlocks and the bonfires and the fairy rings and the magic mushroom rituals and... Ah... I know you can't take this dull domestic stuff. <laughs> Come on, Uncle Bob. Read me one of your fantastic plays. Hey, Bob! Hey, Bob! Ooh. Hey, Bob! Hey, Bob. Hey, over here. <laughs> Recognize me? I'm an innocent southern soldier. 22, according to the script. And color. <laughs> you think my fans will buy me for Southern? 22? We'll estimate my chances at Cuddly. <laughs> hey, oh, come on in out of that muck. Hey, watch that step. They only gave me a cinder block. Glamour of Hollywood, huh? I mean, these trailers cost 10 zillion bucks, and then they just plunk a cinder block in the mud for a stoop. Uh, sit down, sit down, get comfortable. That piggy pass is my producer. We just had a knockdown drag out about this next scene. I insisted they completely rethink it. So we ought to have a half an hour. That's how long they can think. <laughs> hey, have something. A fruit, sandwich, pate. You're not drinking? Incredible. Let me have a look at you. You look good. Whoa. How came you to the limber lost of Missouri? I mean, I'm doing a movie of the week. I got an excuse. What the fuck are you piling problem with Booger Woods for? Don't tell me they got high schools out here. They quit the schools. Well, that's great, huh? God damn, just on the road, huh? You and old Jack Kerouac. <laughs> uh, you, you sure you didn't come here to kill me? I just don't hit me in the teeth. They cost a fortune. You mad? 
Yeah, you should be. I, I, sh I know I should have written you, but, but you know, I'm still ashamed. Well, you didn't cancel that whole production just because I didn't show up now, did you? You didn't? Why? Didn't you want me? I'm just kidding. So, how'd it go? Without me, I mean. Care what critics say, huh? You know you're good. Yeah, well, I felt like a traitor letting you down after all my uh, big talk about breaking loose and doing worthwhile shit. But how they are, and, you know. I did quit the series, Bob. I did. I was going crazy on that damn motorcycle after six seasons. Do you have any idea how sore your nuts get after 37 takes on a Kawasaki 650? You know. They bought me the, the usual uh, 5000 a week raise. <laughs> Not that I'll see it after taxes. Plus, they, they took care of some of my back taxes. <laughs> plus, uh, my pick of the contract girls. Plus, two more classic Porsches. Plus, a carload of cocaine. Plus, some help out of a little situation with the LAPD involving a former classic Porsche an underage contract girl and both food cocaine and three parking meters on Hollywood Boulevard. Even then, Bob, you'd have been proud of me. Even then, I held out. <laughs> Until they said I could do two movies of the week. And hell, man, in this one, I didn't have to have a disease. <laughs> What was I supposed to do? I mean, I've been so goddamn hard for them to handle with the James Dean stuff I pull that when this series ends, and all series end someday, I'll be blackballed all over the industry. Gotta get it now. Hey, you know, they don't control theater. Hey, maybe when my name's all washed up on TV, it'll still be big enough to draw on the stage, and, and we can finally do that play. Another one. You always got another one. Come on, you, you, and Allen Ginsberg, and Dostoevsky, and Van Gogh. <laughs> you guys never get one. I, I try, Bob, I try, but each time they keep driving me back. You see, it's like I got this little drum, Bob. I, I never told even you about it. This little voice in my ear that says, I gotta get it now. Buy my mother that house I promised. One of those fairy tale jobbies with the Walt Disney roof. Pasadena. One block from the start of the Rose Bowl parade. <laughs> Can't afford being poor. I gotta get it now. Oh, Bob, I think a lot of you. I mean, out there on the road doing what you gotta do no matter what. And, and me too chicken to cut loose and be with you like I ought to be. Like Neil Cassidy and Jack Kerouac. Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. Bob, Bob Redford and Paul Newman. Knights of the Road, huh? I count on you, Bob. I count on you to be out there doing what you gotta do, no matter what, and me too. And uh, to make up for cowards like me that just can't let go of the witch's tit. You need money? Let me give you some money. Hey, I'm sorry. Sorry, it's stupid of me. Forgive me. Be sure, though. I mean it. It won't last. You better get it now. Shit, Bob. We'll, yeah, we'll whoop it up in the bayous tonight. Swamplands, igloos, whatever the fuck they got out of here. Right now, I gotta lay down with some witch hazel on my crow's feet. I gotta photograph 22 in Southern. <laughs> Never mind, cuddly. Hey, come on, Bob. Uh, why don't you watch him set up? Hey, you can write about it someday. Watch that step. I don't want to go down in history having a great writer drown in the mud outside my dressing room. Started out life in a trailer house. Here I am winding up in one.
Hello, Samantha. This is Veronica, of course. You said to call today about this time. I'm calling. Sure, I'll hold. I know how busy you must be without me there. Oh, there's my other line anyway. Hello? Bob! Where are you? O'Hare? Well, can you get in between planes? Oh, Mark will die. He's rehearsing with a new band. Yeah. Uh, hold on. My boss is on the other line. Ex-boss. Hello? Hello? Samantha? Bob, hi. No, I'll be on hold forever. She is the busiest woman in the world. That's why I'm so invaluable to her. Oh, did I tell you they want to fire me? Well, that does sound sort of paradoxical, doesn't it? I'll explain. See, this big conglomerate took over the firm, and they want to cut my position. Hey, no, I could care less. It means nothing to me whether I get to investigate executive expense accounts or not. Hold on. Samantha, are you there? Hi. No, nothing but a tape of Burt Bacharach favorites. Do you know the way to San Jose? What? No, Bob, it's the name of the song on the tape. So where were we? Oh, yes. So... Samantha says I can stay if I'll be secretary, not only to her, but to her boss, who they're, they're cutting his secretary to, and all this for the same salary I get now. It's this major favor on their part involving them passing a brand new job description, fall down and worship. The simplest description for the proposed job would be underpaid quarry slave. So, I turned to the two of them and said that I just might be begged into staying if they give me one my own secretary, two, my own office away from that parrot cage called a typing pool, and three, my salary plus three quarters of Samantha's boss's secretary salary too. Well, of course it's unreasonable. I don't want to stay. Hold on. Samantha. Testing, testing. Bob. So they said my name. What? What song are they playing? Promises, promises. So they said my new job and salary requests were impossible. And I told them that the four-dimensional budget juggling that I'd been doing is what was impossible, and that they were welcome to ask that entire sub-moron accounting department to take it on en masse, much less find a single sucker to do it half as well as me. I, hold on. Samantha. Bob, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. I mean, look at it. Samantha, who is brilliant, took 10 years to get to be a semi, hemi, demi executive. And as a woman, that's as far as she's going, believe me. And I'm behind her, so there's no chance of my advancing. And I carry her workloads when she has her breakdowns, and I don't have breakdowns, so I must be really fabulous, right? And I can always get another job, as long as there's any jobs to be gotten, however long or short a time that may be. So why not make impossible demands, right? Hold on. Samantha! Bob, before you ask, raindrops keep falling on my head. So, I draw up on their time a detailed description of exactly what duties I might be willing to consider accepting, omitting Samantha's breakdowns and her boss's weekends with his secretary, which he wouldn't dare try with me. Print out two copies, lay it on both their desks, and tell them that their current job description is to get the damn thing okayed. Then I came home to catch up on days of our life. I am fed up. Hold on. Yo, Sam! Oh, Sam, hi. Sorry to keep you waiting. Yes. 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 You got it. Just give me 45 minutes. Bye. Oh, Bob. Hi, I can't talk to you now. Well, of course they did. Was there ever any doubt? Well, if they'd been this sensible before, that conglomerate never would have taken them over. What are you whistling? Wait, I know. What's it all about, Alfie, right? <laughs> Good catching up with you, Bob. Call me next time you're in town at my office. Ciao. Shit, driver, don't turn this ass end over. Mind if I sit here, buddy? I don't want to sit up there among them Bible thumpers. Of course, back here, you're right next to the shitter, but you can smoke without no one threatening to have a work demand thrown off. 
I seen a guy chuck a woman with him into the shitter, back around Amarillo. Some whore let him screw her right here on the bus. Should have thrown her out the window. God, I hate a whore. Hey, look here. Did you see this? Did you see? Shit, we got queers in Congress. Did you see? Sixteen-year-old boys he had. God, we got queers running the country. And this one over here, he had 16-year-old girls. Government's all perverts and they get after people like me for taxes. Well, I'm sorry if I stink. Yeah, I've been on buses for five days. And I was down in Yuma in Arizona for a job man said he'd give me if I got down there. Me and a bunch of other men from New England, we all paid him for the job and paid our own ways down there. And we got there and they said they fired him a long time ago. The guy that sent us, they said they fired him. We all paid him, paid our own ways. And they said that he didn't have no right to a sentence. Well, I tell you, if I ever get back to me, what I'm going to do to him, all right? See this knife here? This blade here? This is the one I use on anybody who gets in my way. And on blacks on my side of the street and on Jews. Listen here. This is the one I'm going to use on that bastard I ever find him. Yeah, I've been saving it for something special. I only ever used it on the sergeant got me thrown out of the service. Yeah, I've been waiting for some scum that low to warm her up again. And listen here. This is the blade I kill queers with. Yeah, this is the one I like to use on that congressman there. And this other one too. Hell, the one that likes little girls too. Yeah. Maybe I'll get me my bus ticket rerouted. Go through Washington, D.C. Find me them bastards. Hey, where are you headed? You want to come with me? Yeah, you're pretty big. You can grab them, hold them. Break them suckers' arms while I cut out their nuts. Hey, so man, you got to use the shitter. Where in the hell's he going? Ain't no place to sit up there but among them Bible thumpers. Huh? Guess he don't smoke. you read about in magazines. 
even as you walk by here with your arms in the arms of men, your sisters are being held against red hot stoves and fucked. Their faces pushed through broken windows while they're sodomized. Their tongues cut out so they can't scream while lines of men fuck them in their bleeding mouths. Men wear the teeth of women as necklaces under their work shirts. Men carry the preserved lips of the vaginas of women they've strangled, folded in their wallets to show other men. Women are chained to walls in movie studios and forced to commit sexual acts with five, ten, twenty, thirty men, held down and given skull to get them as if they don't smile. Get away! I don't want anything to do with you! I don't want anything to do with any man! Women, don't pass me by. The bodies of women are found in garbage heaps in every city in the world. The bodies of women wash up on every beach and are unreported. The bodies of women are torn apart and put together to make perfect women for men to fuck until they rot. Why are there only men standing here listening to me? Women, 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 don't pass me by. so hot. I like older men because you like me so much. somebody from New York before. He got me hot, too. You think I could make a living there like this? I heard guys get killed and stuff there. I'm going somewhere besides home, though. I know that. Would you maybe want to take me back to New York with you? I'd do anything for someone to take me back to New York. Oh, well, where are you going? <coughs> well, yeah, but passing through to where? <sighs> okay. Be mysterious. I am mysterious too. Like, my real name? It's not Kevin. Run a bunch of dick magazines from Duluth from my database. Most common first name come up was Kevin. I deduced that that was the name that got men hot. Was I right? <clears throat> How am I doing? Should I get dressed or take another shower? Or what? Nope, don't have to be nowhere till four. Class, I go to college up the university. Didn't you see my tattoo? <laughs> Lectured there. When? Oh, well, I wasn't there yet then. I'm just a sophomore. Yeah, I'll look older. What'd you lecture about? I don't think I know anything about theater. I'm into computers. You know anything about computers? Hmm? I'd do anything for someone to teach me about computers. <laughs> hey, you wouldn't be coming to lecture in some computer class now, would you? What if you was coming to a class where I was in it, right? And right there in front of everybody at the side of my pulsating, throbbing virility, you was to get a stone bone on. <laughs> what do you mean you don't do that anymore? What was we just doing? Oh, you don't lecture anymore. <laughs> well, why not? Don't, didn't they pay you? What? Let's start again. Wait a second. Go 
real slow now. I want to memorize this. You, you say you quit because you thought you would just what? A token liberal to assuage the guilt of a lot of fascist tools. <laughs> you guys from New York. I thought you'd get my number anyway. The Advocate? Oh, yeah. I figured it was safe to advertise there. Nobody from around here reads it. <laughs> or if they do, they sure as hell ain't talking. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do it with anyone from around here. Well, wait, now I might do it with teachers if it got me grades. But I already get grades, so fuck them. <laughs> I mean, don't, right? <laughs> Besides, I get enough of you guys just passing through, pay my books and board, couple hours work a week, and my parents think their little boy is still doing dishes. <laughs> so, you're going to be around? You want me to come back? Huh? I get back? Mm. Oh. <laughs> oh, don't you worry, we're safe here. See, it's the Nightcap Motel, right? N-I-T-E-K-A-P Motel. Spelled backwards, let them pack it in. Nobody gonna disturb us here. Who else? I know I had a competition. Where'd you find it? The bus station? What the hell are you gonna do with him? You can't have anything left in you after what we just done. Let me look. Look at you. A man your age, you're ready to rock and roll again. Well, yes, I might be persuaded into staying. How much? <laughs> oh. I'm not too sure I could do much right now. Hell yes, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you'd be ready for the next guy too, wouldn't you? How do you get so hot? What do you mean nothing else to do? Oh, hell. Come on, cowboy! If you've got nothing else to do. You guys from New York. Well, what do you mean you're not? Where are you from? Oh, hell. What do I care? Anyway, I know where you're coming from. Dear Uncle Pat, or Bob, if that's what you like to be called. Don't know where you are with all your traveling, but I just keep making this tape letter to you anyway, hoping someday a famous man will see fit to let his family know where he is. It's Monday morning, about 7 a.m. I just got home from shift. I feel real good. Old Nurse Embry terminated at or about 4 a.m. this morning. Nurse Embry's family is all real tight shits, and they would have kept her on them machines till the end of the world. So all us nurses is real relieved. And I expect to sleep well all day as soon as I get your grandnieces off to school. I love Nurse Embry. Boy, when I first came to work under her, she put me through hell. She said, the Dallas Head Wound Center is the busiest, most advanced brain damage treatment facility in the universe. The eyes of the world are upon us, and I don't take shit. <laughs> I wouldn't have lasted ten minutes if she hadn't have taught me to be tough. And then, 
They brung her in last week with that horrible head trauma from some dumb cow truck collision. All us nurses cried like newborns. I always think it's so sad when any sort of medical care expert, they get struck down with the very kind of ailment they spent their life treating. Boy, nobody worked harder than Embry. Trying to get reflex responses out of patients the damn doctors would give up on. Helping those little child victims learn to talk again with whatever side of their brain was uninjured. Talking them stupid country girls out of going ahead and marrying some cowboy that had had half his skull tore away. Oh, we all hated to see her lying there looking like a squid. That's what she would have said if someone trussed up to a lot of tubes like that. Looks like a squid. She was from somewhere else. Ever since her accident, we all come in early or stayed late, shining pen lights in her pupils or stimulating the soles of her feet, looking for any sign that there was anything going on in there at all, or that there ever could be again. And then, her goddamn sanctimonious relatives come in with their Bible and gladioli and stood around her praying and singing and talking about suing somebody like the really religious ones always do. And her not really in there at all, thank God, because they were bringing her little lace bed jackets. Imagine old blood and fire ember in little lace bed jacket. Well, Uncle Bob, she didn't have no husband. There are no children. And she had always been a woman, so inspiring to see the way she had been. So proud and brave, like a mother to us all. Morale on the floor was way down. And this new chief nurse they drug in, always so busy sucking up to the doctors. You couldn't talk to her like a professional about what we all thought ought to be done for good old Embry. I went up to the roof where the helicopters bring in the traffic cases. And I stood a long time watching the twin radio towers blink on and off. And then I looked down <coughs> at this big concrete embankment below. God, Uncle Pat, I hope when my girls grow up, they have some strength and courage and sense. There was a look old Nurse Embry would get on her face when it was time to do what ought to be done for some hopeless case. There always being some more hopeful one that could use the floor space and expensive machines. We called it her concrete embankment look. Because her fine old face would get as cold and gray as that concrete embankment. And now there she was, lying there with her eyes rolling and drool coming down her chin. So, now. Every one of us night nurses, we made a solo tour of the ward last night. We made sure of that, so no individual could be under any kind of judgmental suspicion. Just like Nurse Embry had showed us how to do. And after, we all congregated in the nurse's office for a good pot of fresh coffee. And someone had brought in homemade donuts, and we sat and told stories we remembered about Nurse Embry and laughed, and some of the nurses knitted like some of them always do. And on my way home, the sun come up so pink and so shiny. I went out of my way to see maybe it was the blue bonnets already up and in bloom. And they are... Lord, I hope I'm giving my girls all they need to grow up to be good, strong women. I gotta go in now and get them up and ready for their school. Thanks for listening, Uncle Pat, if you ever get to. We all love you, and may God, if you believe on him, be with you. Wish we could be there to take care of you, but since we can't, you take care of yourself. I just got to turn in now. And so, goodbye.